Hello, hello. Welcome to the Good Garbage Podcast. My name is Veth Krishna. My primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner. We will be speaking with material innovators, creators and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerative future. Their stories will help us answer the big question, what is good garbage? Today we get to speak with Thomas Philippon, CEO of Total Energy Corbion, which is one of the leading manufacturers of PLA, a short form for polylactic acid, uh, which is a biofilm material produced at scale using sugars and starches. It is probably one of the most viable plastic alternate out there that is at least industrially compostable. And it is also evolving really fast. The markets are really hot uh, for PLA today. During the conversation, we explore more about the product and also Thomas's plans for growth and change through this ideation. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Well, Thomas and I met very recently at uh, an amazing conference called Rethink Materials, and we got talking about how we can collaborate, how we can do things uh, that will make a big difference in this world. So I'm so happy to have you here, Thomas, with us. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. No, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. I mean, it's great to be able to uh, exchange on ideas how we can push the envelope and define basically, basically some new solutions uh, that we clearly need, right? But we'll talk more about that. So thanks for having me, Ved. So Thomas, I'm going to start uh, with uh, Thomas the person and your life story, because, you know, the amount of things you've done in terms of, uh, you know, starting as being a chemical engineer and then moving into management, into marketing, and then moving into the C-suite, uh, you know, be working such a long time with DuPont, uh, and again, across the world, which is fascinating, you know, what you've done. Uh, you've worked in so many areas. So I would love to take a step back myself, just hear the whole life story, as much of it as you can share. You know, how did Thomas, the person now, get to be the person he is? No, that's a, that's a very nice question. And to be fair, it's a, it's a bit hard to reflect on uh, who you are and where you're coming from. What you see is basically the summary of all your previous experiences, yeah? And I've been very fortunate, as you said, to be uh, very early. I was really interested in both sides of the equation, on the business side, but also on the technical side. So I made a kind of a conscious decision to go first exploring the dark side of the technology and going through the uh, chemical engineering studies. But very quickly, after working a bit in pharmaceutical industry, uh, in operation as well as a plant manager in Egypt for, for basically agrochem chemistry, I came back to the other side of the equation, which was also another dark side, which is the business side. But, uh, and then I joined DuPont and I, I was ab about to merge basically my two passions, finding some science-based solutions and helping customers to, uh, to resolve some of the um, very hard problems uh, when it comes to plastics. Yeah. And very quickly during that journey, I found out that I had a special interest finding solutions which are based on the environment, right? And I've been very quickly known as a green guy in DuPont, uh, trying to find uh, most of the time solutions which are based on partially uh, bio-based material or which has a certain functionality and a, a very uh, lower impact on the environment. So very quickly and uh, very naturally, I've been attracted to lead the uh, Total Energy Corbion adventure as the CEO because here we are basically manufacturing, uh, marketing and selling uh, PLA, polylactic acid, and every single time we sell one kilogram of polylactic acid, we know that we're going to save about 75% of the uh, CO2 emission that you would have done with uh, conventional plastic. So it's talking about innovation, it's talking about global solution, it's talking about uh, doing the right thing for the environment. So at the end, it's also a very nice summary of what I was trying to do as an individual, and it's linking very much with the value of the company I'm driving now. That's amazing. And I'm going to I'm going to stay with my question, and I want to learn more about your journey at DuPont, because DuPont is such an amazing company when it comes to making products. Not only did you work on creating products, you worked on marketing, on you know, different parts of the world. So can you tell us more about, you know, your journey there and what you learned in terms of building products? What were the products that you were very involved in? And and also your global exposure, because, you know, you were born in France, you live in Netherlands now, and there's a huge amount of Asia and Africa and all that mixed in. 
No, thanks. Thanks for the question. Indeed, it's uh, I've been also very fortunate to, to travel and, and to be able to work in, uh, in different continents, different countries. As a matter of fact, I lived and worked in three different continents. Uh, I've been working and living in the US, in Houston, in Texas. I've been also living in Egypt, uh, in, uh, in Cairo. I, I have the pleasure to live most of the time in, uh, in Europe. But uh, through those personal experience, I, I found out that uh, we share a lot of the same issues. I mean, when you are not only talking about professionally, huh, talking about uh, what we need to deliver to global customers uh, from, from an industry standpoint, I'm thinking more at the other level, at the individual level, at the, I would say, uh, global level. We, we do face the same type of issue. And when you travel a bit, you realize quickly that maybe you don't speak the same language, but you suffer with the same type of uh, issues. So that, that was also a very hard link between what uh, we were doing in DuPont and now we, what we're doing in, uh, in Total Energy Corbion. We're trying to find solutions to, to the bigger problem. Uh, and indeed, which is very interesting, and, and DuPont has been a very good school there, to get back to your question, is trying to understand what are the specialties, let's say, or the, the peculiarities, let's say, of each of the uh, regions and, and trying to play by those rules, but at the same time trying to find the, uh, uh, the solutions. So if I'm taking some of the uh, product and some of the application have been evolved specifically in DuPont, it has been to try to find some um, solution around flexible material, uh, which would be basically meeting some of the challenges of the automotive industry globally, but at the same time to find a solution which would be partially based on, um, on, on, on uh, renewable resource. And I've been involved specifically on the uh, specialty polymer um, side. Uh, it was basically the uh, long chain nylon, like the PA1010, uh, PA910 or PA912, and they are also partially uh, based on, on renewable resource. So at the same time, we're trying to find solutions to uh, global issues, uh, to some specifically uh, global industry issues like the automotive industry. We are trying to reduce the impact on the environment uh, and trying to, to do this, uh, respecting some of the sales process in the different regions. So you need to be open. You need to understand that uh, there is not one single solution, but still you try to do the, the good thing for everybody across the world. Yeah. And that must give you such a great insight into a wider variety of products, you know, just working on these numerous chains, bringing in sustainability to those. And then, of course, uh, now taking a jump towards the polylactic acid world. The other thing which I read connected to this is very interesting is about this whole world that you participate in of mentoring startups and uh, looking at the mass challenge Switzerland. I would love to hear more because a lot of the listeners that we get are people who are really interested in this domain. Many of them are startups and interested in growing their business. So it'll be interesting to hear how you got into this idea of uh, building this mass challenge in Switzerland. And you've done it for many years now to mentor startups and what are the kind of startups who come and what is that all about? It'll be great to hear. No, that's, that has been a very rewarding experience. And, uh, and to be very blunt, I've been uh, drawn into that uh, from a colleague one day who told me, you know, have you considered mentoring startups? And I was doing my career in Switzerland, uh, working very hard in DuPont, trying to, to do different things. And um, I considered the, uh, the question uh, a couple of times and said, yeah, actually, that's, that's great. Uh, let me try to get involved. And uh, you no, know, I've been involved for uh, at least five years or so. And that has been always a great joy. So what is, why I'm basically a, a mentor and a, and a judge in a mass challenge is very, very simple in a way. Huh? I'm getting into a, a career stage where I've seen uh, quite a few things. I made uh, quite a few mistakes and I became basically aware of some expertise that I may have, which are a bit differential, right? And what I bring basically to the equation when I mentor, or when I judge is basically this experience. So it's, I'm really happy to share what I've learned, what, I, what worked, what did not work, and also to, um, to, to share a bit of this uh, uh, different adventure uh, we had when you get into 15 years in an industry. And it's uh, always a joy to come back uh, to those type of forums where you met uh, so many great individuals who just want to do the right thing. And uh, I never met any entrepreneur that did not want to solve a big problem. So that's great because you, uh, you are here, you try to help them to to orientate them uh, to the right direction. Obviously, you don't have the solution, but you do have uh, a couple of advice, a couple of tricks that you can share that would maybe avoid them to get uh, directly in that pitfall or that would uh, get them in touch 
with people that can help them and can help their adventure. So definitely, it's a, it's a joy for me to, to be uh, working with Mass Challenge. Mass Challenge is uh, based in, the, in Switzerland, but there are other chapters all across the world. And it's uh, basically a process where there is a selection about uh, some of the startups. There is a bit of a competition, but this is not really about the competition. It's more about the process where you, uh, you have an opportunity basically to uh, discuss and exchange with people from the industry and get uh, some guidance on the, on the business case and to get connection to, to the industry. And at the end of the day, it's really like an accelerator in order to make sure the, the idea is coming to uh, flourish uh, as quickly as possible. But it has been a, a great adventure and um, there is no uh, minute where I consider not to go as it's, it's great for, for me also to be able to share back. But uh, to be honest, sometimes you also cross some, uh, some startup which uh, could have also a direct uh, impact on the business we are we're running or are in now. So does the mass challenge focus on a certain domain or is it a very wide uh, array of uh, industries and technologies? Uh... Yeah, it's, it's actually a good question because I must say that when I joined, the themes uh, were slightly different. So, I mean, to answer straight to your question, there is no uh, specific domain which is uh, basically asked. But you can see with the years that there is some theme which are more apparent than others. Uh, let me take an example. When I started, there was a lot of startups wanted to go into the food type of uh, industry, you know, the, especially the uh, connection between internet and food services, like deliveries and stuff like that. So that has been very much on the equation. And now, uh, in, in the couple of years ago, they were more into uh, uh, artificial intelligence, where people wanted to find some, some solutions and, and to use uh, basically the, uh, the artificial intelligence to, to solve big problems. And now we are getting into a different type of vibes where people are trying to find alternative to, uh, to materials, for example, or alternative to, uh, to some of the uh, energy we use. So it's funny uh, to, to a certain extent because you see also um, this helping uh, the industries and a couple of different industries to find solutions depending on, uh, on the year and depending on the, on the trends, but also depending on the problems we, uh, we face as, uh, as humanity at the end, right? So... It, 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 you, does see, uh, you do see the, the trends changing uh, with the, the problems that we're all facing. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah, because it's sort of, you know, the, the, when you see the kind of industries coming in, you also see the trend in business as general. You know, people are investing more in technology or in sustainability. Or The other thing which was very fascinating for me, that you're a certified pricing professional. I have no idea what that is, Thomas. So I want to know more about what does that mean and you know, how does that help you as, as leading a big uh, organization? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that is actually, I, I get that question from time to time. What does uh, basically a graduate in pricing is, is doing? And that's, that's funny because when I uh, started basically to be involved in, um, in the business world, I always had uh, basically different passion and definitely pricing was never one of them. I mean, I can tell you that for a fact. So I was coming more with saying, okay, I like marketing and so on. But very quickly, I discovered that pricing is definitely, uh, it should be a matter. It should be actually uh, uh, some kind of expertise that you could get into the, uh, the university and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit a uh, provoker there. And why is that? Because pricing is so important uh, in any of the function you think about in, in a company, huh? Pricing is really at the, at the heart of uh, many of the different divisions. I, I take an example. If you want to start basically a new product, okay, you can develop a very nice value proposition, but very quickly, uh, somebody would say, okay, that's fine, but uh, what would be the pricing to start with, right? That's already a, a very, very good question. Not so easy to answer if you don't have any tools in order to assess that. And you can. Huh? You can study pricing uh, like you study any other uh, matter, but it's it's something that you need to ask uh, upfront. It's a fun, fascinating word, and the more you get into it, the more you discover that you have tools, uh, you have experts, uh, you have a lot of resources that can help you uh, basically to do the right thing, and but also more importantly to run an efficient business. So pricing is actually a very fascinating subject when you really get into it, and don't uh, wait the last minute to ask uh, what is the price I should be selling at. You should have that uh, very early in the process to make sure it's efficient enough. I can actually totally relate and imagine that because it's always such a challenge. And, you know, there are so many parameters that you have to think about. 
So I'm going to I'm going to segue a little bit now and uh, talk more about Total Energies Corbion. What led to Thomas uh, Philippon, who was a professional with Dupont for so long, you know, 15 years is a long time. And so what led to you joining Total Energies Corbion? How did that happen? And uh, what was it that drew you uh, into that uh, role? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. And it is a, a question that uh, I considered for quite some time. Uh, I will explain a bit more. First and foremost, I was getting to that stage of my career where I wanted to give back a bit what I learned. And I've been very fortunate to, uh, to work for DuPont. I've been there for 15 years and, and learned so much. And that was really uh, like a school to a certain extent. I've been giving different challenges. And I was getting to a stage in my career where I wanted to, uh, to make sure I, I share that even in a more, uh, would say, a closer way. Uh, in a structure that maybe was not so huge and that where I can basically uh, influence uh, many more people. So that was a bit um, in my head, right? At the same time, I was joining Mass Challenge also to give back uh, some of my experience. And I said, mm, where shall I go from uh, from DuPont? And I d- did want to uh, to work in a smaller organization. I always had, as I told you, I always had innovation as a passion. So I wanted to join basically an industry where innovation was really differentiating. And uh, as I said, you know, sustainability is becoming uh, more and more in front of what I wanted to do every day. So it, it really came uh, as, a, as a surprise, but also as a, as a very nice surprise when I got approached to, to, for that job, right, as a CEO of Total Energy Corbion. Because that was exactly the job I wanted to do. I wanted to be in a smaller entity carrying a lot of innovation where we wanted also to do the right thing uh, from a sustainability standpoint. And basically, given the opportunity to shape up a, a company in such an industry is actually a, a blessing. So I'm, I, I have no regrets so far. And there is still a lot to do and a lot to, uh, to propose to the industry as solution for the future. So I'm, I'm pretty happy to have made the jump. Hello, listeners. We want to hear from you. We want to learn more about the ideas that you would like us to explore in the domain of regenerative packaging and also people you would like us to speak with. Follow the Good Garbage podcast on social media and post your questions to us. I assure we will select and answer some of those questions in the forthcoming episodes. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit more about Total Energy Scorpio. Total obviously comes from the space of petroleum and, uh, and, and has been in this business for a long time. It's a large conglomerate. Uh, Corbion uh, was one of the trendsetters when it comes to PLA and, you know, one of the early, early, uh, you know, companies that came into it and literally built this world of PLA. So how did the whole merger of Total and Corbion happen? And then how does Total Energies now look at Corbion as being part of it? How does that all come together? Um, and it's, it's not so obvious, but it's actually a, a very good uh, mariage, as we say in French. Right? It's, a, it's a very good combination of uh, complementary skills. On one hand, you get basically Total Energy that is really in the middle of a, a great transition. They really put uh, basically the money where the mouth is, as we say, right? I mean, they are really uh, investing a lot in trying to get to that transition from fossil-based uh, energy to more renewable energies. And in that quest, they wanted to do that across all their businesses. And you are not without knowing that uh, they have quite a bit of a, of a business in the uh, polymer world, right? They have business in PS, PE, and PP. And they want also to make sure they have a right way to transition out of the conventional plastic. So they were looking at uh, basically some ideas how to do this in, a, in an elegant way. On the other hand, uh, strategically and historically, Sri Corbion has been a big producer of uh, lactic acid. Their story was really trying to get the more value out of this very specific ingredient. And they were thinking about, oh, can I valorize that? They had some knowledge about how to make uh, polylactic acid from the lactic acid and they were looking at complementary skills in order to make it as a business and not only as an idea or R&D program. So definitely when they met uh, with Total Energy, which has that as their skills actually, they know how to scale up things, they know how to run uh, assets, uh, they have access to the uh, different markets where polymer is used. So the combination of the uh, sourcing of the lactic acid plus the technology around the polymerization of the PLA 
combined with the access to the market of the total energy plus the rigor around building up plants and making them efficient was actually a great combination and it's a, that's a great recipe uh, for total energy carbon. So from the start, both companies had some strategic uh, alignment and then they came up with uh, complementary skills. So that made uh, this uh, venture or that joint venture actually a nice adventure. <laughs> And it's also it's also so proactive when I look at it. You know, we can criticize all we want, but ultimately businesses have to transition. And it's so refreshing to hear this from you that, you know, the whole idea of total energy that, OK, we are in business, but there's a future that needs to be built and we are going to be proactive about it. We're going to maybe invest in renewable energy. We're going to invest in bioplastics. We are going to transform our ourselves because sometimes, you know, we get the whole ostrich syndrome where we just dig ourselves in and we think that, you know, everything is going to be okay. And of course, it must be an amazing leadership uh, within Total Energies to be able to transform itself. So it's, uh, it's great to hear that. But looking at the scale, Total Energies is huge. But what will be very interesting to hear is that how does Total Energy see the whole movement? What is the size of the petroleum business right now? What is the size of the bioplastics business? I'm sure there's a huge growth plan in the bioplastics side. So can you throw some light on that? Yeah, it's um, so on one end, uh, I'm, I benefit huh, from the both names. So the joint venture is called uh, Total Energy Corbion. On the other end, we are really an isolated entity to a certain extent. What I mean by that is we have our own status. We are headquarters in, uh, in the Netherlands and, uh, and I have basically shareholders with uh, equivalent representation from both Corbio and Total Energy. But uh, I think intentionally, we are not linked to any of the Corbio or Total Energy, uh, I would say official network or, or let's say working network. So I'm completely insulated. Uh, of the uh, basically internal uh, guidance or guidelines uh, from the Total Energy or the Corbion Enterprise. So what I can say and what I can basically relate to is basically things that I see also on the news and uh, things I know of uh, the two companies. So um, that's a bit the disclaimer <laughs> before my, my comments, but definitely uh, this is really a, a different entity. The Total Energy Corbion is a 50-50 between Total Energy and Corbion and and we are really insulated from that. But having said that, you're completely correct. I mean, it's uh, uh, there is different size on the two shareholders. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly the latest numbers for Total Energy, but randomly, it's about 200 billion euro company. And Corbion, I think, is around 1 uh, billion euro company. So you have these two companies uh, with different skills, as I said, they, they chose to join together in order to, to basically deliver some solutions to the world. And I think it's, it's beautiful as well to see that it's not only uh, the big guys getting together and trying to find solutions. We are in between and definitely, I mean, we are also uh, very happy to be able to run uh, basically our company with the help of the two shareholders, but not to be uh, too uh, constrained huh, by the two companies in the day-to-day -day, uh, life, which I think is also a, a nice recipe for success. I agree. The independence is so important. And, you know, it's good to hear that there is a, you have independence in functioning of Total Energy Scorpio. One billion is not small. Of course, it appears small when it comes to 200 billion, but it's a big company, you know, when it's, uh, when you look at Corbion. But I want to, again, take another segue into the product. I know very little about PLA. We use it a lot in our packaging because we transitioned from plastics to PLA in our manufacturing uh, because that seemed to be the best option and it was available in the market. So I have been a user of PLA. Some of the listeners uh, may know the product well, others may not. So it's just a little bit on what PLA is and how do you see it evolving? Um, starting with PLA, so by the name, it's named polylactic acid. And it is made uh, as a polymerization of uh, lactic acid. So lactic acid could be also seen in different areas. Huh? Uh, if you are a, a bit of a sporty, you may have uh, some time to time uh, this feeling in your muscles. And, uh, and some of that is, is made because you have a bit of lactic acid in your, in your muscles, right? I mean, you can see uh, and find lactic acid in other places. But lactic acid, at the end of the day, this is really coming uh, from the sugar, right? So you, you can basically ferment uh, sugar and, and get lactic acid and we polymerize it into a, a material. So at the end of the day, when you have pellets of uh, PLA and we have pellets of uh, another plastic, they seem very similar. 
when you convert those pellets into a bottle, when you convert those pellets into a tray or a film or a fiber, they would look alike, they would be very uh, similar to any of the conventional plastic applications. And that's a bit tricky because you don't see the very much the difference, but they have uh, basically the very same appearance. But the big difference is the polylactic acid is coming from lactic acid, which is coming from the sugar, which is and could be extracted from very different feedstock. And that's another beautiful thing about the technology around the lactic acid. You can get lactic acid from different sources. It could be from sugarcane, uh, it could be from wheat, uh, it could be from starch, it could be from the, the beet. So it could be already coming from different feedstock. And that's very versatile. And most of the time, and all the time, actually, we're going to be choosing through our partner Corbion. We'd be choosing basically the feedstock, which is in abundance, you know. And we are really trying to make sure we use the crop or the feedstock, which would get basically the most efficient. To take an example, our first plant is in uh, Thailand. And there, Thailand is very well known for a great exporter of sugarcane. And we have been using basically the sugarcane through a third-party certification in order to make sure we, we don't deplete any of the resource and it's really renewable in good practice and so on. But we have been basically using this sugarcane in order to get the lactic acid and to polymerize it. So each time, as I said in the opening, each time you would use one kilogram of PLA compared to any of the conventional plastic, you know that from the start, you would basically be saving about 75% of the CO2 you would have uh, consumed otherwise. So that's, that's really the main difference, the main value proposition of the PLA. When you talk about the application, we are in front of a polymer, of a plastic, if you want, uh, of a material, which is really starting his, uh, his journey. What I mean by that is if you think about polystyrene, if you think about polyester, uh, about PP, about P, all of these materials have, have been long with us, right? I mean, some of them have been around for at least 50 years or more. And we have found basically application where they fit, right? Or they have the right functionality. And we are getting used to them, right? In, uh, in some of the application. PLA comes now as a new guy, the new kid in the block, if you want. And we are just starting uh, to find the places where PLA uh, can be actually uh, very good uh, as basically an alternative just from a sustainability value offer, but also very good as a, as a performing material. If I take one example, PLA can be used in the uh, 3D printing and uh, we have been uh, had a lot of positive feedback uh, from the user saying uh, PLA is just the best material from just a, a plastic property standpoint to use in such application because he has this operating window which is uh, very permissive and he has also the other value proposition that if you get basically some uh, of the item you don't want you can get to a certain end of life, which would be also positive on top of the uh, first value proposition around the CO2 uh, saving. So, but we'll get back to that. So um, getting back to your questions, uh, the market where we see a lot of growth for PLA at the moment, as I said, 3D printing. We have also a lot of growth in the non-woven industry, which is uh, also picking up very nicely. And our historical application has been more into the food packaging and some of the agricultural films. And those guys are also uh, working very, very well. So it's a collection of different applications uh, where uh, you have basically steady growth. And on top of that, you have a couple of uh, applications which are growing more astronomically, I'd say. When we talk about PLA, we're talking about growth rate between 15 to 20% on a yearly basis. So we are talking really about growth product there. Is the lactic acid and hence the PLA different when it comes to different feedstocks. So of course you can use a starch and the starch could be from corn, from potatoes and, you know, and then converted to lactic acid, or you could use sugarcane molasses and that could then be converted to lactic acid. Does that make a difference when it comes to the actual product or it's absolutely the same whether you use whatever feedstock you use? Now, that's, that's the beauty of the technology, huh? being a, a chemist. We don't see any uh, differences when I'm talking about the PLA, when I'm using basically a lactic acid coming from either corn or lactic acid coming from sugar cane, right, or, or beet. As long as I get the lactic acid with the, the right specification, it will not impact uh, the production of the PLA and the performance of the PLA, which is making it a very... Uh, very good, right? Because I know that if tomorrow I need to build up a plant uh, in a different place in the world, 
uh, there would be actually not only one solution, but there would be many solutions that we'll be able to, to study, make the best choice I can from a sustainability standpoint, from a, a life cycle assessment standpoint. That's definitely very interesting and gives you a lot of scope for development and growth. Uh, one thing you mentioned, and it's uh, very interesting, is is the product. You know, as you said, it's still a new kid on the block, so things are being evolved. And you said that they're very similar uh, in many ways to plastics. So I would love to know, you know, how similar and how different uh, in good and bad, both, you know, whichever way you want to look at it. No, no, definitely. Huh? It's, uh, it's similar uh, in the way it looks but definitely we are in front of a, of, of a different animal. If you take the, uh, I'm talking about bioplastic, but if I go back to the, to the PLA, I mean, PLA is uh, bio-based, as we said, right? 100% based on this renewable resource. It is uh, compostable. Uh, so we do this uh, biodegradability test to make sure that uh, we have basically, the, we fit the norm. So it's industrial compostable. And we are def developing basically some solution that would be also home compostable. And it's also uh, basically mechanically recyclable or even uh, chemically recyclable. So we, we do have basically an animal between brackets, uh, which is very versatile also on the end of life. And that's really different uh, from the conventional plastic uh, comparable products. So that, that's kind of very different. Having said that, and I think to go back to a comment I made earlier, but also about what you just said, uh, we are in front of a, of a plastic or of a polymer which is in the start of uh, finding its uh, niches or finding its way into the applications. So um, to, to give you a bit of a personal story, uh, I used to work for DuPont and at one point I had basically to find uh, what we could sell as a sustainability packaging offering. So I was in charge of that globally and it was in 2008. And I've been basically uh, looking at uh, how I can help to push the envelope. And uh, I came across uh, Purac at the time, which is the old names of Corbion. And they were doing this uh, PLA and uh, everybody was complaining about the fact it's brittle, right? And uh, I've been basically developing a, an additive from DuPont that would help basically the, the PLA to, to, to do a better job in terms of forming the name of the additive, I think, was Biomax Strong. So we developed that. And, and we are going around saying, hey, there is a solution there. Nobody is talking about Biomax Strong any longer. Uh, no, the PLA has made some growth um, and has been some innovations. I mean, not only uh, from the total energy Corbion side, but also from the natural work side, which is the other big provider of PLA. So the industry altogether learned and developed that. And uh, one of the main applications nowadays is, uh, is really about thermoforming. So that's just a small example that in, uh, what, in 12 years now, uh, a bit more, 14 years, uh, we, we are making a, a lot of steps. And what was really very brittle, not working, nobody wanted to use it because it was a bit strange. No, you have basically kilotons of application of this uh, specific, uh, with a specific grade in that specific application. So PLA is really starting uh, to, to find its way. Uh, just to give you another example, which is giving you an idea of that journey. Is, is about the last application that we developed, and it's a, it's a face mask. So maybe some of our listeners know exactly uh, how to make a face mask, but it's not so obvious. It's not only one, one sheet, let's say, of polymer. You have basically to, uh, to glue uh, between brackets uh, different layers with different meshes, right? And it's very technology-driven, a face mask. And we managed to do that with PLA now. So we managed to develop not only as a way to, to do the meshes, how to uh, basically melt them together, but also getting the right uh, performance. So now you got basically face masks, which is as potent as a surgical mask, which is made from a material which has been there forever. So, you know, this is just another example that if you get basically uh, the innovators together, if you get basically the different value chain player together, you can break some of these that nobody uh, would have thought could be done. I mean, in 2008, if somebody would have come to me and say, hey, Thomas, try to develop basically a face mask made out of PLA. Honestly, I would have said, yeah, I like challenges, but maybe not this one. And today it's, uh, it's, it's actually a fact. So taking it forward, what are the applications that you are the most excited about? And what do you think is going to make the biggest impact, biggest difference? And where are you putting, you as in Thomas and your team, uh, putting most of your energy in maximizing uh, the usage? It is a good question. And um, let me answer it in two ways, right? Uh, first, from an innovation standpoint, and second, from a 
system standpoint, and I will explain a bit. The energy we put definitely, as, uh, as I said, I mean, we love innovation, we love uh, trying to find solutions for the industry. So definitely we are very close to the brand owners, we are close to the OEMs, we are close to the uh, trendsetters because they are the closest to, to the consumers that we are, right? So we want to make sure we solve basically the big problems. So food packaging is definitely something that's going to stay and we're going to be close to that and try to find some of this uh, solution like in an innovation way. The other one which are uh, also coming very, very strong, as I said, are basically the market or the segments like uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing. We see that also very strong. Uh, the non-woven and the fiber, already mentioned them, are also uh, places where we can really add value there, trying to find alternative and reduce overall the, uh, the footprint for everybody. So those are basically from an innovation funnel standpoint, from a where you want to go next, who you want to work with. Those are, are really uh, segments, markets where we want to spend more energy, but also spend more innovative time in order to find a big solution there. But the space of bioplastic is not stopping at finding an application and trying to find an innovation. We are really a big promoter of the circular economy and trying not to think only about the performance that you want in a certain segment. You want to make sure you develop a solution that can come back in a nice way, in a virtuous way, uh, and to close the loop. So we are spending quite a bit of time also to propose end-of-life solution with the application. So we are working very, very hard and, and, and very much uh, also with the legislators, uh, with some of the uh, basically sorting companies, some of the recycling companies, to say, okay, when we have markets, basically a solution based out of PLA, how does, does that work, right? Where does it end up? And it, we should really end up in the right place. Uh, so we have been developing tea bags application or coffee capsule application. And the best for this type of application is to make sure they end up into composting, right? Into industrial composting or home composting, depending on the type of, uh, of, of article. But this is definitely the, the best end of life. So we would try to influence where we can uh, some of the uh, geography where maybe for this application, we don't have this type of uh, compost array, a uh, composting chain yet. So trying to share, educate, and say, you know what, the application by itself is great, but it would be even greater if it was getting into where it should go. So that's one example. If you take uh, the other example, which is the uh, bottle application, we are, we are thinking that the best end of life there would be just mechanical recycling or even chemical recycling. So we've been working with partners uh, to do pilots and to say, look, when we deliver the plastic bottles, we can take back the empty bottles, shred it and, and put it back in our plant where we can chemical recycle it and, and give it a new life. Again, this is not something that I can do globally, but I want to share that those are possible and we want really to spread the good word. So we don't stop at investing in innovation and finding solution. We try also to invest in making sure that we have also some ideas about the end of life because it does not stop with the sale of the product. It stops when you're sure that you have basically the full cycle. I remember when we initially started to push PLA for our packaging, our board was kind of not happy at all because we were paying almost three times the price of, uh, but we said, no, we are trying to build biomaterials. And if we package in traditional plastics, that's not right. It's not uh, living up to what we are doing. We are seeing a trend where it's becoming more and more cost effective. So as a pricing expert, how do you see this trend? How do you see the prices converging? Because in my mind, pricing is always a comparative idea because if plastics didn't exist, then PLA will not be expensive or cheap. It's only because you have a benchmark but there, there are elements which are always true in the, in the pricing book, in a way. There is the first one, which is called uh, supply and demand, right? Which would be always true. And I know it's a basic of economics as well, but this one will always work in a way, right? So it's obvious that before we had very small base and very expensive, right? And now it's getting a bit more democratized. I mean, you have more asset producing PLA. Uh, you have basically more demand as well, right? And uh, we are getting into cycles where we have much more demand than, uh, than production, which make it still a bit more expensive. But very quickly, uh, with the, the additional capacity, we'll get a more balanced situation where uh, the pricing will tend to also harmonize, right? Uh, around uh, 
I would say, a more competitive cost. But that's one way to look at it. The other way is to look at the value in use of such product. And I think it would be a bit polemical, but I would say that when you look at the, the value in use on the full cost of oil based, are we really trying to cost the full price of it? I mean, again, uh, going back to the origin of it, going back to the end of life of it, are we really uh, trying to, to look at the full cost and, and, and the real value uh, which is resulting from, from those alternatives? When you look at the bioplastic, it's a bit more obvious uh, where it's coming from, where it's going, and, and to have a look at uh, basically what it really costs to the planet. So I think it's depending where you stand, uh, if you look at the total value of the offering and the total cost of the offering, then uh, you get into more, I would say, rational comparison. Otherwise, you will always be comparing basically a bioplastic uh, with the, the full cost of it compared to basically a, a oil-based alternative, which is partially cost. I mean, for me, it's, uh, it's about uh, end. I mean, it's not about, okay, should we use a PHA-based or PLA-based? I mean, no, try to use both, try to use one or the other. I mean, we have so much to replace that uh, we should all uh, expand the cake and expanding that cake would also bring a much more economical solution and uh, an easier choice. Uh, for the people to uh, to choose to go for the bioplastic against the uh, the conventional plastics. Yeah, I I agree with you, and I wish everybody would look at the total cost. But when we go to customers and consumers, people just look at cost and isolation, which is actually an anomaly for sure. But that's the world uh, we live in. Yeah, maybe just to to rebound on that because that's also sharing uh, some a personal experience. I've been in that business, I told you, about 12 years ago or so, uh, 14 years ago. And uh, I was going to the, uh, the brand owners and, and, and to the OEMs with this same pitch saying, OK, do, are you interested in bioplastic? And, uh, and guess what? All the sustainability officer and some of the senior managers would say, yeah, yeah, sure, bring us something. And I've been wor working in some project, sometime even two years. And, and, and going back, I have to say, hey, I have something which works, right? And they would turn around and say, oh, yeah, how much does it cost? And I uh, would say, yeah, maybe it's a couple, uh, it's two or three times the price of your convention. And that was the end of the story, right? People would just say, oh, yeah, that's very nice, but okay, we'll continue to do what we're doing. Um, that was kind of the behavior at that time, right? No, it's completely different. Huh? They all have uh, the brand owners and through the pressure of the consumer, huh? the brand owners and the OEM, they all have commitment. Now, I mean, they all made pledges that they're going to have a certain percentage of uh, sustainable uh, packaging by uh, 2030 or, or they want to be carbon neutral by a certain date. And now they turn back to the industry with a different ask. Uh, they don't start with the, okay, how much is gonna it's going to cost, right? They start by asking, do you have a solution? And that is really different. So I think the, uh, what I wanted to convey today is also this type of uh, positive environment where we're in. I mean, people are really trying to, uh, to change the way we're going. Uh, they made some commitments themselves, so they are really like, asking us to find solutions. And that's the best we can have, right? I mean, everybody needs to look at, towards the same goal and, and trying to, to work together to find the solution. And it's happening today. So that, that is a big change in the industry that I've seen in the past uh, 12, 14 years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'm, we see the same uh, sort of uh, shift happening in the products uh, that our organization does as well. And the acceptance level is far greater. And the consumers and the customers are clearly driving uh, this journey and enabling us to sort of build better products. So I'm going to actually, there's a beautiful uh, sentence I read from one of your interviews, which is, I'm going to quote it. It's uh, partnership is the key throughout the value chain. And that's sort of, links well with uh, this understanding and it'll be great for you to tell us about this idea and how do you see partnerships evolving and where does Total Energy Scorpion seek maximum partnership in order for people to come in and talk to you guys? Yeah, no, definitely. And, uh, and that's partnership at the big level. Huh? We, sometimes we tend to, we have a chip which is telling us, okay, the value chain is uh, the, the material producer and then there is a converter and selling to the uh, brand owner and, and, and there is a consumer and this is a linear value chain. And we, we try really to, to look at the ecosystems and says partnership could be really in different type of uh, place of the value chain. I'm not basically saying that we don't work with our converters or with compounders or with the uh, brand owners. Definitely, huh? we'll keep on doing that. And this is really important to make sure we get uh, basically a good alignment of what we try to do. 
But at the same time, uh, we also work, as I said, with different type of companies like uh, the CTO in France or like Tomra. Uh, these are also guys in the ecosystem which are going to help uh, at the end of the day to allow basically some specific standards in a, in a country to help with making sure that the PLA is accepted at the right place in some of the sorting center. Or Tomra is a machine manufacturer which is developing great technology to be able to sort PLA before it polluting any of the different waste streams. So we are not working not only, uh, only with the value chain, which is the traditional value chain, but we try to get out of the comfort zone and try to really help the ecosystem to find the, the right solution. So definitely, I mean, the partnership is really key because at the end of the day, Total Energy Corbion, we are bringing a material uh, to the equation, but we are not bringing a solution. Huh? The solution is coming only from the partnership through the value chain and through the ecosystems. And, and as humankinds, that, that is how we progress. You know, we're bringing different ideas, different people, different possibilities uh, together. You've again talked a lot about recycling and that being a big thing. When I see recycling in the world we come from, it's normally downcycling. Like you can only downcycle so much and then not be able to downcycle anymore. Is that any different when it comes to PLA? Of course, PLA is considered to be an industrially compostable material. Is there a lot of focus also on building home compostable products? So more or less uh, bringing a bigger question together, which is end of use, trying to keep it in circularity. How do you see that? How do you see and what will be your focus going forward? In that? We try to be humble uh, in those uh, debates because they are very complicated and uh, there are a lot of things we can do and there are also a lot of externalities. What I mean by that is uh, we really believe in a model where you want basically to have these closed loops. And we look at the benefit of every single closed loop. For example, if I'm taking uh, some PLA article and I can just reuse it, there is actually no problem to do that. If you get to a certain application where after a certain uh, uh, usage, I mean, you cannot really make too much sense. So you lost basically some of the properties that you buy for right? Let's look at what we can do with it. And that's where I think the work that we do up front, thinking about, okay, what is this application about? What should be really the, uh, the best end of life? The first loop could be a mechanical recycle loop. We can think about of a, of a longer loop, which would be more of a chemical recycling loop. Or it could be what we call organic recycling, which is really the composting, industrial compost where it can be done. But we're also developing some of the other formulation, which would be home composting where it can be home composting. Uh, it's not an or, it's an end, again, uh, answer that we try to give uh, to the industry depending on the application, uh, depending on the geography, depending on the access to the end of life, we will try to develop basically the best product we can. Uh, we believe it's not up to us huh, to decide uh, either or, but it's up to us to provide solutions that would be basically available for any of the uh, networks that you are benefiting from. So we don't have any position specifically in any of the end of life. It would really depend on the application we're talking about. And I think our, uh, I would say, responsibility is to continue to provide a, a lot of different products which would fit any of these end of life uh, networks which are existing today and we should really benefit from. No, I, I just think that's so beautifully put uh, because, uh, because, you know, like I think of it as uh, we all have our own calling. So, you know, people like you and in a much smaller way, us are building products. We need to build more and more of it and scale it. And hopefully the world will evolve both in terms of the feed materials and in terms of end of use. So how do you see what is your dream uh, in the next five years in terms of scale, in terms of uh, the usage? How do you see Total Energy's Corbillon evolve? There is... A I would say a selfish answer to it, but there is also a bigger answer. And I think that's, that's more why we are together and why our team is working every day. I mean, definitely, I mean, if you look at, uh, at the CEO and say, okay, wh what is really your dream is definitely huh, the same as all the CEO in the world. I want my company to continue to flourish sustainably and, and, and bringing basically uh, more solutions to, to the equation. So we do have aggressive uh, plan. We want to continue to grow and, and, and build basically plants. I mean, we do have our, our first plant in, the, uh, in Thailand. It's basically a plant which is producing 75 kilotons of, uh, of PLA uh, at, uh, at the nameplate capacity. 
and we have communicated our uh, decision uh, to make an investment in France uh, that's going to be two, three years uh, or so, and that's going to be producing uh, 100 kilotons. We do have still a, a lot of work to do, and uh, we'll try to contribute as much as we can and uh, as quickly as we can to that big equation. Size does matter in a way, and not from a, okay, from a total energy carbon way. I mean, definitely we want to have more plants and, and, and to bring more quantity to, to, to the world, but it's also a, a way that you prove that together we, we're doing the right thing. I mean, we talk about PLA, but as you also mentioned, PLA sometimes is just an enabler for other bioplastic to flourish. Uh, the industry knows that some of the formulation on the market are, have some PLA in it, but a bit of PBAT or a bit of, uh, of a starch compound, uh, a bit of PBS, and all of these are, are basically a panel of new solutions. When you combine all of them, you can have uh, different solutions to the bigger equation. So the fact that we'll continue to flourish or to build up different plants would be also a good proof point for all of us as an industry that we are continuing uh, our journey to, towards basically replacing some of this conventional plastic. And the fact that our company will grow and, and maybe overcome the market uh, would be also a very good sign for us uh, in a selfish way, but also a good sign for the industry that we continue to lead the way and we continue to, to find solutions together in order at the end of the day to have a less impact on the environment, which is uh, basically the thing we sh all share wherever you are. And we have only one planet as we, we, we read many times. So, Thomas, in the end, uh, this is the inevitable question, and I would love to hear your views on this. Uh, what does good garbage mean to you, and how do you see the world evolving towards it? That, that's a very good question and a, and a tricky question to answer. Ed. So um, I, I was trying to put a bit of thinking into it, and, uh, and for me, a good garbage is actually not the question, or it's not a, exactly a good expression. Uh, it's not because it's semantically wrong, <laughs> but it's more historically wrong. So what I mean by that is a good garbage for me is a concept which is coming from the economy when you look at it as a linear economy model. So our economical model is based on sourcing, producing, delivering and consuming products. And the step of the, of the garbage or the end of life was never considered in the model. And the value of it uh, was not thought through, right? The value was considered to be built between the moment you source, you produce, you deliver, and you consume. So there was no value to it, or that's how we end up with this idea of, okay, the garbage is, is, is basically valueless, right? A different way to think about that question, I mean, do we really care about having a linear economy, or should we think about a circular economy, where every single step is not a step which has value or not? It's not even a question, because every single step is basically a feedstock, an ingredient for the next. So they are all valuable by design. So I think for me, let's try to think about the model we really want for us. And that would be a, a, an easier question to answer because all of the steps would be actually very valuable and none of them would be either wrong by definition or by design, or they would have a very a good uh, value for the next one. So thank you so much again for coming and talking to us. Thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. I look forward to the growth of the company and I look forward to many more conversations with you. So thank you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Ved, for uh, having us and uh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, let's continue to push the envelope. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. We look forward to your suggestions and ideas through your comments and reviews on the various forums the podcast is present on. Thank you again.